Good morning! I come to you live from the shores of Bear Lake. Bear Lake. It's a, a lake over here in the corner of Utah and the Idaho border. Uh, also, the Wyoming border is just to the east of here. I travel through this area occasionally on my way to Logan, Utah, or up to St. Charles, Idaho, which is St. Charles is about 10 miles to the north of here. And I've asked the Lord numerous times as I've gone by here that on some weekend that he would allow me to find rest here and to be able to give a message from the shore. And, uh, well, here we are. What a, what a blessing. What a blessing this is. Um, you can't see this, this lake is probably close to 15 miles long or, or longer. Not real wide, but just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. So thank you for being here. What a blessing it is that I'm able to be here. And it just, it enhances this this morning to be able to stand on the shore of a body of water. And it reminds me of how often Jesus taught from the shore of the Sea of Galilee. No, this isn't the Sea of Galilee, but it's probably as close as I will ever come. And no, I'm not Jesus. I'm just a representative of him. So it's good to be here. Great to have you here. Let's, let's begin. Let's begin with today's message entitled Peace. But before we do that, would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, you are the peace giver. Peace comes only through you and from you. Lord, as we listen to this message this day or this hour, May the peace that transcends all understanding just come over us. Help us to learn how we can obtain that peace and how it will come over us if we seek it. And we seek it from you, not from the things of this world. So thank you, Lord, for, for this message, these words, and for those who will hear it. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Peace. Well, I I had a piece of pie the other day. Or I had a piece of pizza. Is, is, is that what we're talking about? No, that's spelled a little bit different. That's P-I-E-C-E. -E, uh, part of this English language that it's got to be extremely difficult for a foreigner, someone who is born of another native language to learn this English language. So I had a piece of pie, or I had a piece of an apple, or I had a piece of pizza, or a piece of cake. Now this, this is a piece, P-E-A-C-E, -E, a piece that transcends all understanding, a piece that we can only obtain through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the piece that we're talking about. And I have to ask you, yeah, my hands are in my pockets this morning. It's a little chilly, just a little bit of a breeze. I'm actually using the shelter of a, of a small shrub-like tree that's right here next to us as a, as a shelter um, from the, the light breeze. But it is chilly here this morning. It is chilly. And the sun is, is going to come over the mountaintop over there here before too long before this message ends and and it's just an overwhelming sense of peace here it is an overwhelming a positive overwhelming sense of peace to be able to stand here before you this morning but this peace this peace that comes only from god how do we obtain it we're going to learn that this morning or this day this hour we're going to understand that well Peace comes only from God. God 
is a God of peace. Well, let's dive into the scriptures and learn more about this peace. Now, this first set of scripture isn't going to even mention the word peace in it, but it's something that we first have to come to terms with. To be able to obtain this peace that comes only from God, there must be something that we do, that we are required to do, that, no, it's not a works-based thing, like salvation, that some people think salvation is. To obtain peace is not works-based either. We can't do enough good things to obtain God's peace. There is something else we must do. If you will turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. And I encourage you, open your Bibles this day, because we're going to have a lot of lengthy readings as explanations or stories um, establishing this peace and what it means to some people. And see if you can relate. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonia churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Okay, now some of you are, are already thinking, well, does, is he saying already that we have to give, we have to tithe? Is that what we have to do? We have to tithe to a church or to a ministry or, or something along those lines to receive this peace? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. We're establishing where these people were, this church, these churches in Macedonia. In the midst of a very severe trial, they were under trial, they were being persecuted, they were, it, it was difficult for them. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Their overwhelming joy or overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, those two went hand in hand. How can that be? Well, let's keep reading. Welled up in rich generosity. Verse 3, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Verse 5, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. Verse 5 is the key here. What did verse 5 say? And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. It doesn't say they gave, first of all, they gave their money or their tithes or their talents or anything like that to God. It says they gave of themselves to God. You want to know how to obtain peace? The very beginning establishment of that peace is giving of yourself to God. Have you done that? Have you given of yourself all that you are? Have you given all that you are, all that you have, all that you will ever be? Have you given it to God and all that He is? If you have not, given of yourself to God, you will never have the peace that transcends all understanding. You will go to your grave seeking peace from somewhere, someone, something, because peace is only found in God. And we receive that peace when we give of ourselves 
to God. Now, I could stop the, this message right there. But some of you don't believe. Some of you say, oh, no, there's more to it than that. Oh, I have this peace, and I haven't given my life to God. Or, well, I've given myself to God. I've given him everything of me, but I still don't have this peace. I question you. Have you truly, truly given everything of yourself to God? Or just bits and pieces? The parts that you're comfortable giving away. Well, that's a great establishment for this message on peace. That we first have to give of ourselves to whom? The world, to our spouse, to our children, to our, our boss, to, to whom? To God. And if we have not done that, you have no true, authentic peace. You may have a counterfeit replica of that, that Satan in his, in his deceitfulness may lead you to believe that you have this peace and you have that peace right up until that counterfeit peace right up until you face the trials, you face temptations, you face hardships, you face a, an illness, a health issue. And then that peace, where did it go? It was counterfeit. It was superficial. It was not the peace that comes from God. Do you find yourself in those shoes? Let's go on a little bit further. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 14. Beginning in verse 1. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've given your life to, to God, you've given him everything that you are and everything that you have, you've given him to God, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're in a relationship with Jesus, you're referred to as one of his disciples. A child of God is a follower of God, a believer of God, and also a disciple of God, okay? So you may think that Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples that were in front of him that day, but he's actually speaking to us as well. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. You know the place where I'm going. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. How many of us want to see more? of the Father. Show us the Father. Yeah, Jesus, I know you were a teacher. You were a prophet. You walked on this earth. You are my Savior, but I want to see God. I want to see the evidence of God. I want to see the evidence, the results of his promises. I want to see glimpses of heaven. My friends, look around. Look around. I'm going to pan out here just a little bit and let you see there's the sunrise coming over the mountains. We may just stay in that angle for just a little while until that gets so bright we can't see anymore. You want to see glimpses of heaven? Look around you. Look around you. It's everywhere. God displays his majesty 
everywhere we can look. For the glory of God is displayed in the heavens. Last night as I was parked here, I was looking out the sleeper window and watching the stars come out in the darkest of dark night here. And the stars were just so bright. How can you not believe that there is a God? How can you not believe that there is a God? How can you not find peace in knowing that there is a God? We go on in, in John chapter 14. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Many people I know are looking for more, more and more and more. Show me more of heaven. Show me more of you, God, and then I will believe. Then I will give my life unto you. I will give you everything I have because then I will believe. What did Jesus say in Scripture about this? The Jews need to see to believe, but the Gentiles, which would be you and me, can merely hear the word and believe. How many of you are like the Jews where you must see to believe? I'm showing it to you, my friends. God's majesty, His grace, His mercy, His beauty, His power is on display for you here this morning. Just look at the screen and you will see God as I step out of the way. Oh, we go on. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than me, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. That's not for the unbeliever. That is for a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples. Now verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, will be given unto you. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live. You also will live. What is Jesus telling his disciples? He's tell, excuse me, he's telling them that he's going to be crucified. He's going to die on that cross. He's going to be buried. He's going to disappear for a time, like three days. And then he's going to reappear and he's going to walk with his disciples for 40 days. And then he's going to ascend into heaven with a promise that he's one day going to return. What is that return? We know it as the rapture. When he returns to the clouds, not to the earth yet, but to the clouds. And he calls his church home, his disciples, his children. Will you go and meet Jesus in the clouds on that day? On the day of the Lord, will you go and meet Jesus in the clouds? Or will you be left behind? Will you be left behind? Verse 19 again, before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Excuse me. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus? Do you keep his commands to the best of your ability? 
The one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied in verse 23, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken in verse 25 while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. We finally got to that word peace. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. My peace, Jesus says. Not the world's peace. Peace, I leave with you. He's leaving a piece of himself. A P-I-E-C-E. A part of himself is remaining. And that is his peace. That peace that transcends all understanding. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. In the beginning of verse 27. Let's turn to Philippians 4 7. Turn to Philippians 4 7, but I want you to put a tab in there somehow, some way. Keep your thumb in there because we're going to return to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does the peace of God do? Guards our hearts and our minds. In whom? In Christ Jesus. In other words, we find peace only in Jesus. If we lose sight of Jesus, we lose our peace. We cannot have peace in the absence of Jesus Christ in our life. My peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we turn our back on Jesus, our peace is washed away. When we come back to Jesus, think about this for a moment. Think about the, the prodigal son. He had everything he needed, but he wanted more. So he asked his father for his inheritance early. And then he went off and squandered it. He found himself in the midst of a famine, feeding the swine, which was a horrible thing for a Jewish boy to be doing. Jewish young man. And he came to his senses. And he returned to his father. And he regained his peace. How many of you need to return to the father? Because you've lost your peace. Or your peace is waning. It has lost its strength and and. Endurance. It's like throwing another log on the fire to produce heat. Or the log that rolled away from the fire rolls away and eventually begins to just smolder. But when that log is put up with the rest of the logs and it reignites in fire. How many of you need your fire reignited? 
my friends, if you can't see what's going on behind me with the, the rising of the sun, and he's, he's keeping it behind the clouds this morning. But look at the, the reflection on the water. Wow, I just looked over there and just got blinded. So don't look too hard over there. I, I might cover that up just a little bit. But do you see what he is telling us? That if we lose our peace, it is only because we have turned away from Christ or we do not have Christ at all. In John 16.33, John 16.33, Jesus says, I have told you these things. And if you want to know what those things are, read, read the scriptures above there. But he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. God speaks through his word to give us peace. Peace through Jesus Christ. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. How many of you are comfortable having trouble in this world? Well, get over yourselves because you're going to have trouble. God's word says it. I don't know what kind of trouble that's going to be. But in the midst of that trouble, are you going to turn away from Jesus and lose your peace? Or are you going to lean into Jesus Lean into his peace and persevere through the difficulties of this life. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. We turn to the gospel of Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 34. Do not suppose that I have come to the, bring peace to the earth. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on just a moment. Jesus is peace. And he says here in the word, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those aren't very peaceful words. Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace to the world. I came as peace. And the only way you're going to receive that peace is not through the world, but through me and a relationship with me. The only way you're going to have a relationship with me being Jesus is if you give of yourselves first unto God. Have you done that? He did not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. We turn to the Gospel of John, chapter John 3, 16, 17, and 18. For God did not send his son into the world to. What? That wasn't 16. What does John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And with that non-perishing and that eternal life, you will have peace. For God, in verse 17, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict in verse 19. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Why did God send his son into this world? To be the peace that transcends all understanding, but to bring the sword of the word so that you and I may one day understand we're sinners in need of a Savior. That we will one day understand that this world will never give us peace. And God did not give peace to the world. He gave it to the individuals. This tree beside me does not know peace. The water, the rocks, the sand, the trees in the background do not know peace. It is only something that is offered to you and to me. And the one who will receive it will be referred to as a disciple of Jesus Christ, a child of God. We go on. In Luke 12, Luke 12, beginning in verse 51. Jesus says again, or it's reported of what Jesus said again. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. You see the division that God's word creates, the sword of God, the Word creates division in the families. It creates division in the workplace. It creates division everywhere across the face of the earth. Division. Have you found a division when you gave of yourself to Jesus Christ? You gave of yourself to God through Jesus Christ. Did you find yourself feeling a little bit isolated? Maybe from your family, your co-workers, your friends? That's division. And God tells us that that's going to happen. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing to have happen. We go on. We stay in the Gospel of Luke. We go to the first chapter. Luke chapter 1. Beginning in verse 76. Now we know about John the Baptist, right? We know his father's name was Zacchaeus, right? Not Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Zachariah is the father of John the Baptist. Zachariah's song begins in verse 67, but we're going to pick up in verse 76. And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of, of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of what? The path of 
peace, the path of righteousness. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to obtain truth or peace? It comes only from me, Jesus says. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 25. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named, named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by that Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Verse 27. Moved by the, by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was custom, what was the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, what did he say? Sovereign Lord, you have promised, in verse 29, Sovereign Lord, you have promised. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. As you have promised. A promise that was given to Simeon by God was fulfilled. And that peace that transcends understand, all understanding. Simeon said, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Sometimes we may wait for a long time to see a promise be fulfilled. And when we see that promise fulfilled, how will we accept it? How will we receive it? Will we receive it and say, thank you, Lord, for the peace that the fulfillment of that promise gives me? But is that only the only thing that will give us peace? Are we waiting only for God's promises to be fulfilled in our life so that we have this peace? No, it goes back to the very beginning. If we give ourselves to God through Jesus Christ, we will have peace and it will be immediate. Do you have this peace? We stay in the Gospel of Luke. We go to the seventh chapter, beginning in verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denari denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. 
Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? In verse 50, Jesus then said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This woman was not going to experience peace until she received her salvation. How did she receive her salvation? Through her faith. What does this story tell us? That no one is so vile to God that they cannot be saved. No one is so vile to God that they cannot be saved. It is our decision. We must make the choice to give of ourselves to God. In Acts 10. Acts chapter 10 verse 36. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel. Announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Again, if you're seeking peace from the things of this world, if you're seeking peace from anyone other than Jesus Christ, you will not find the peace that transcends all whole understanding. Yes, you may have a sense of peace. That counterfeit peace that Satan offers you, that he deceives you with. That's not peace, my friends. It is a lie. And that lie will be revealed the moment you feel pressured. The moment you have to deal with something, whether it be an illness, whether it be a divorce, a death in the family, loss of your job, financial difficulties, whatever it may be. You may even find yourself in prison. Will you find peace like Paul? Like Peter? They were singing hymns in the midst of their jail time. The dark, dingy, likely rat-infested prison cells that they were in. They were singing praise to God. How were they able to do that? Because they had the peace that comes only through Jesus Christ. The peace that transcends all understanding. In the book of Romans, chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. Romans, chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. What is the way of peace? Jesus Christ is the way of peace. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You cannot give yourself to God without faith in Jesus Christ. Without giving of yourself to God, you cannot experience the peace that transcends all understanding. We stay in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Right there's the answer, my friends. You want peace with God? Understand that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Submit yourself unto Christ. Give of yourself to God. Fully and authentically. 
not just through some sinner's prayer that some pastor or some spiritual leader led you in and you really don't believe what you said you don't even know what you said you didn't feel a, anything happen my friends if you are truly in christ your heart has been changed and it was changed immediately second corinthians five seventeen: anyone who is in christ is a what a new creation the old is gone the new has come what is a part of that new creation the peace that comes only from god through your relationship with jesus christ do you have that peace, my friends? Do you have that peace? We go on. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. We glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces what? Perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We stay in Romans. We go to the 8th chapter. Chapter 8 beginning in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed... The Spirit of God lives in you. How does the Spirit of God live in you? It is a result of you giving of yourself to God, your salvation. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Does that give you peace? Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Beginning in verse 7. Before I read this, I want to ask you, are you enduring hardship? Are you facing difficulty in this world right now? Where is your hope? Where is your peace? Do you have hope? Do you have peace? Do you have Jesus Christ? Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. Endure hardship as what? Discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all, all had human fathers who disciplined us, and most of us, most people, have respected them for it. Now, I added that most people. It's not all of us have had that respect, and I'm not going to lie about it. They dis disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his what? His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and what? And peace for those who have been trained by it. 
we go back to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. I told you to keep a thumbnail in there, some sort of a marker. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. We read verse 7 already, which said, And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, let's go up to verse 4. How can we obtain this peace? We've established that we have to give ourselves to God, right? we got to give of ourselves to God first, through Jesus Christ. Become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that peace that transcends all understanding will come upon us. But once we have experienced this, once we have given our life to Christ, is there more? Do we just expect this peace and then just live in that confidence and just take it for granted? Or is there more to it? It says here in verse 4 of chapter 4 of Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Will you rejoice in that peace that you have? Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. This is God's commands. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And... The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does that tell us? Within that peace, we must maintain a relationship with Jesus Christ, or that peace will disappear. It will fade away. And this is where, my friends, a lot of you find yourselves today. You don't have peace. You maybe once had it, but you no longer have it. Why? Because you've drifted away from Jesus and your relationship with him. Why? Because for some reason you've lost your hope. Why have I lost my hope? My faith has become weak. My trust is no longer what it was. You're lacking peace because you have turned away. You don't continue to build on your relationship with Jesus. How do we build that relationship? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, every situation, not just the ones that you think are meaningful to God, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. That's having communication. That's prayer. Communicating with God through Jesus Christ, through prayer. That's open dialogue. It's a two-way communication. We speak and then we listen. But most people only do the speaking and then they rush off into the busyness of the world and don't listen for Jesus' response and wonder why they don't have peace anymore. Or why their peace is so weak. Is that you this day? Verse 8 goes on to say, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Don't get so involved in the things of this world that you lose sight of God. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. These are attributes of God. Think about God. When you see the sunrise, Think about God when you see the stars shining in the heavens. Think about God when you see the colors of the trees and the fall changing colors. Think about God when you see the leaves first pop out onto the trees in the spring. Think about God when you're going through the struggles of this life. Think about God when you go and you get in your vehicle to drive to work. Think about God when you get to work. 
think about God when you're making supper, when you're making your lunch, when you're eating breakfast. Think about God when you're brushing your teeth. Think about God when you look in the mirror. Think about God. Or that peace that transcends all understanding will begin to drift away from you. Galatians 5.22 Galatians 5.22 What is the evidence of a relationship with Jesus? We begin in, in verse 19. We're not going to express all these. Sure we will. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is the acts of the flesh. But the acts of a child of God are these. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They have given themselves to God. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. For the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God tells us that His children will produce fruit. And that fruit is represented in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we bring this message to a close out of Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with the hope with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. May God fill you with hope and peace. God, through Jesus Christ, as, what does it say? You trust in Him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the peace. The peace that you have given me as I have put my hope and trust in you. As I have surrendered my whole self, all that I am, all that I have, all that I will ever be, I have surrendered unto you, Lord. And the peace is just unbelievable. It is undescribable. But it is real. And through the disciplines of this life, as I go through this life, Lord, and you discipline me, I accept that discipline as a form of growth, as you leading me down that path of righteousness and that path of peace, which comes only from you. So, Lord, as those who hear this message, I pray that they too, if they have not already found this peace, that they will surrender themselves to you 
and find that peace. But Lord, as we speak openly, there are many in this world that have somewhat given of themselves to you out of fear of going to hell. They've given themselves unto you as an escape route of going to hell. That isn't truly giving of themselves to you. That is part of Satan's deceit and a counterfeit peace that they experience for a time. But Lord, as you discipline those who call upon your name, may they see the truth and turn from that deceit. May they come to terms with the fact that they're not really saved. And that if you were to return to the clouds today, this moment, this very moment in time, they would be left behind. May they see that, Lord. May they feel that. And may your peace of your peace that transcends all understanding begin to work in their heart this moment to bring them unto you, to bring them unto true and authentic, real salvation where they may find peace in you. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.